Hello. Hello and welcome everybody to SDVOE Live. I am your host, Justin Kennington, and this is TV for Pro AV. I'm excited about today's show. Our guest is going to be Dan Farisi. He's the editor in chief of Commercial Integrator Magazine. When I called up Dan and, I, and, and he agreed to be on this show, which was wonderful, I said, Dan, what do you want to talk about, right? Your job is to be out there in Pro AV talking to people about what's on their mind and what's important and what's not important. And, and, and so what is it? What should we talk about? Um, and he shared with me that Commercial Integrator, the magazine's focus is on the business side of AV integration, right? It makes sense, commercial integrator, right? It's like it's how they came up with the name, I guess. We'll ask him about that. Um, he said that recurring monthly revenue is a major hot topic. And, and you know, I knew that because I hear about it all the time. I don't personally live in the world of integration. Um, so I don't, I don't have recurring monthly revenue in that sense. But I wanted to dig in with Dan about why, what does that really mean? Why is that important? How do we get it, right? Because I think we'd all love to have an income stream that just pays us money every month, right? Wouldn't that be great? Uh, but how do we get it? Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about with Dan. Uh, so sit tight because the interview is coming up in just a few minutes. Uh, I also want to remind you that today we will have our after show. So after the show is over, that's how we came up with the name for that. Uh, make sure you sit right where you are, let the credits roll, and put your feet up, relax, and you're going to get your chance to ask questions to Dan, to myself, to my co-host Matt, uh, by sending us questions to live at sdvoe.org. Just drop an email to that address. Or if you're with us on the SDVOE Academy or you're with us on the launch platform, look down below my feet down there. You'll find a chat box where you can interact with your fellow audience members during the show, but you can also get your questions to us. We've got moderators in the chat there who will make sure that Matt and I have your questions ready to give to Dan for the after show. So make sure you get those in there. Uh, with that, I say let's get on with the show. I'm going to send you guys to your first quiz question of the day. Let's have a look. Right. Anybody know the answer to that one? I don't know. Let's get Matt in here. Matt, you're in the Hotline Central. Are you with us? This is United States calling. Are we reaching? Here I am. How are you? Good, good. Uh, yeah. I'm having a blast over here. I'm, I'm oh, excited to talk to Dan, uh, and I hope our audience is too. So let's make sure those questions are coming in. How's it looking over there, Matt? Absolutely. It's looking really hot? good. As you, can, you can tell there's lots and lots going on. Lots and lots going on behind me. Really looking forward to this show because uh, this was always a bugbear when I was an integrator. How do we make, how do we get the recurring revenue model going? Uh, so we've got a team of moderators you can hear in the background, uh, taking your calls, answering your emails, and Dan's here with Justin to talk about that exact thing, recurring revenue in AV. So get your comments and your questions in, live at stvoe.org or... If you use the chat, you can use the chat right here in the academy. So give us your feedback on the show, give us your feedback on everything. We want to hear from you. Uh, as always, we have a question in from Sheila from Ontario, Canada. All the way from Ontario says, I've heard a lot about service contracts as recurring revenue, but what other structures of recurring revenue are out there? Really good question, that, because there are others. Love it. It's going to be very okay. exciting. I'll put it to Dan and we'll find out. Well, why don't you head on out of the Hotline Central and join me here on the stage and we'll take a look at some news. Will do. never gets easier. Ooh. Those stairs, they never get easier. But hey, when you get into this age, it's good to keep in shape. How are you, sir? How You look well. Good. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice, nice to be here. Nice to see you. I understand you've had a lot of driving this weekend. I hope it yeah. all uh, went smoothly for you. Yeah, it, we got there in the end. Yeah. Uh, little minis, not really designed to do huge long distances with six foot three geezers driving them. But hey, do you know what? 
<laughs> Every day's a school day. <laughs> Shall we do some news? Bring it on. Right, so the first topic of news we've got coming up today, cracking, uh, cracking read, I have to say. Uh, a little service over here, if you don't mind. Is that, is that how you say it? Hey, a little service over here, it'd be great. I'm practicing my American That's accent, it. so when I'm over to see you guys, I can fit in. Uh, all about service you and practice. monitoring. And, and it's got a, uh, for me, it's got a, a, a nice sort of balance between the recognition that the commercial AV integrators are already taking, um, you know, the service model. They've got service departments. They, they've got service techs, and they've already been taking this seriously for quite some time. Um, but, but now as, we, as we're shifting forward, and, and as we see, we, we'll talk about in the second news section, uh, you know, it's kind of going from a, a, hey, this is a great thing to have, to pretty much having, it's got to be in your business. And, and re residential um, AV integrators often find this quite tricky. And as, as you know, Justin, I was a residential integrator many moons ago when this head was full of hair. And uh, it was hard work. I mean, you had your own integration technicians, but then having a service tech uh, was actually, you know, quite a different discipline to have. And it was, you know, it was hard to try and pick that kind of business up, even though you knew that it was integral to not just the, the flow of money coming in, but also the value of the business. What was your take here? I'm curious, did you have a dedicated service tech or service department in, in that business those years ago? No, not dedicated, but we, we had two guys who kind of, they, they looked after it, if you will. They were integrators sure. first time round, but then they were, you know, they were the guys that looked after all of the remote management systems and, and logging in and checking in with the clients and making sure that, you know, we used to do it a little bit like, um, uh, like you would service a car. So the client would have a, a logbook, you know, and they would be say, well, look, we'll look at you, you pay for us to keep coming back and looking after your, your system, just like you would with your car and your system will keep running smoothly. And uh, that was, that was, the, that was our idea and it worked pretty well. I'm really looking forward to hearing what Dan's got to say. That was, that was, I think, just, just the challenge this article talked about. I, I, mm. He didn't come out and say it. He talked about how the average residential AV integrator is a, is a quite small business, probably less than a dozen people on average. Um, what he didn't say is that the, I think the average commercial AV business is much larger than that, especially these days with all the big uh, mm. uh, mergers and acquisitions going on there. Um, and I think it really is, a, there's a certain size where there's a tipping point that you have enough recurring service revenue, you have enough recurring service issues that it, that it makes sense that you, that, you, that you can make service a full-time job for someone instead of, as you say, you know, well, I've got an integrator and he has to take the service calls when they come in. Um, right. You know, that's a challenge you have to live with at a certain small size. It, it is, yeah, and you had to do it. Sorry, guys, got to just leave you to it just for a second. Got to go and ring Mrs. Miggins. She's got a problem with X, Y, Z. But then that was the that was the all important part about making sure that we were getting in there first. Hey, your service is due for uh, booking. We need to book it in for next month or whatever it might be. And it also gave us a little bit of. Um, a little bit of power back again when if a client, which they invariably do, you'll have seen this guys when the clients are saying nothing works, nothing's ever worked and all that usual that they send you. Um, but you say, well, hold on a minute, I'm just checking in here. Um, yeah, we haven't, you haven't let us come back to service it for well over a, a year or well over so many months. Um, you know, did, did, you, did you treat your Aston Martin on the driveway the same way, Mr. Client? Did you, did you not bother with that either? You know, and and once, once, it was, once the simile was made between, um, okay, this is, this is what you do with your car, this is what you do with your, with your home entertainment system that you've spent a lot of money on. Once that penny dropped, then it became a lot easier to, to communicate the importance of, 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 of maintenance and aftercare, as we called it back then. Mm -hmm. Shall we? And, shall we? Shall we move into our second topic? Second news yeah, topic. Um, moving yeah, on. From there, there. And there you are interacting, interacting with that client. <laughs> Apologies, uh, no. giving them a good experience, and that's and that's the perfect segue to this to this second article. It is. Right? It is. A, a taken care of client is a happy client. Yes. Well, <laughs> hopefully, yes. Yeah. It's. Uh, <laughs> it, it, this is. This for me is. You know, but by taking on the managed services element, you know, that offering that for client retention, uh, again, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing Dan's uh, pro take on this. But, but for me, you know, do my clients need retaining? Do I need, do, I, do I need that retention element putting in because I'm going to lose them possibly? 
And while you think the answer may be yes, it, it's not just it's not a short thing to to suddenly just say, hey, we're going to do some maintenance after care. We're just going to charge the customers X amount of money and make sure that then certain things are covered. There's a lot of planning really does need to go in to to creating like a maintenance and aftercare package in your business. So, you know, today is going to be really helpful for those of you that aren't really doing it or not sure if you're doing it the right way. Today is going to be a really useful stepping stone to hear what Dan's got to say, because once you get it right, mm -hmm. there are certain products in your um, in your pantheon. There are certain products that you install that don't go wrong very often, you know, um, and, and it's those products that we can you know, begin to really include uh, as part of the, the, the general everyday recurring revenue. These things aren't going to go wrong very often. So if you're paying us a monthly fee to make sure that we cover them, if they do go wrong, then we're covered. You know, which bits of, are you going to include a TV that's on a wall? So if that ever went down on Christmas day, you know, we turn out and replace it for you. Is that included? Can we cover it? Can we do it? So there's a lot to think about. Sorry, I'm going on here, but this is, this is a great topic for me. <laughs> a really good topic. Near and, near and dear to your heart. Yeah, yeah I think you know, I think any I think any successful business realizes without panicking but realizes that they're always at risk of losing that client to someone else. Um, and, and if your only model is to install the big system, collect the check and then and then call back in two or three years wondering if they want something new, if instead you have a, a contract and a, and a recurring business relationship, then mm. you know who are who else are they going to turn to? Yeah. When it's time for an upgrade, when it's time to, to expand to their new office, you're going to be that first phone call. And I think that's a, another strong reason, uh, besides keeping your own business in order, keeping, keeping your client list in order, keeping them happy, and keeping the install side of your business growing. Well, I'm going to jump out now, get back into Hotline Central, so I'm going to leave you with Dan. Have fun, and I'll see you in a bit. Thank you, Matt. Um, as I mentioned, our, our guest is the Editor-in-Chief of Commercial Integrator Magazine. We're very pleased to have him with us today. Dan Farisi, why don't you come on in? Dan, are you there? I am here. Thank are you so you? much, Justin, for having me. I really appreciate it. Well, well, thanks for joining us. This is, this is a great topic, um, and, and I hope our audience finds it as useful and interesting uh, as I do. So why don't, we, why don't we start with the very basics? Um, and this might even seem like a silly question, but I want to hear your answer. What is recurring revenue? So it's definitely not a silly question. Commercial Integrator exists to be a business handbook for those in the commercial integration industry. And if integrators are trying to make their business better, there's no such thing as a silly question. It's just about trying to find those strategies. And some of them are really kind of outside of the box and they require some thought and they require some planning. What is recurring revenue? It's a, rec a regular cadence of income, whether it's a monthly cadence, a quarterly cadence, annual. The idea of having a regular flow of income, it tends obviously to help with integrator's cash flow. It, w it lends predictability to an integrator's books. So you don't have these big infusions of cash with one capital project. And then there could be a drought or a backup or something. And then you, know, you can run into cash flow issues. So it's kind of a shift from that capital expenditure CapEx model to an operational expenditure OpEx model. So just drifting away again from those one-time project-based cash infusions to a predictable regular cadence where you can build your cash flow and your books around it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I was going to ask what's so important about recurring revenue. You just talked about this, this cash flow and, and sort of the, the bookkeeping element of it, which makes total sense to me. Uh, what are some of the other reasons that a recurring revenue model is, is important and valuable? I think one of the most important reasons other than those cash flow issues centers on uh, just having strong relationships with your clients. I mean, I think everyone in the integration industry would probably agree that it's much, much easier once you have a client to retain them and do project after project or service after service with them than doing a project, closing it out, and then trying to find an entirely new prospect. So I think one of the real benefits of RMR is also just the stickiness aspect. It's going to keep you mm -hmm. in front of that client day after day, week after week, month after month. If they have other projects or other services that they need, you're going to immediately come to mind. And you may not have to have any kind of a bid situation or a competitive situation, because if you've serviced them as well as you potentially could, they might just say, I want to work with your firm, period. Period. And then it's uh, you know uh, right in your hands. You don't have to compete. You don't have to bid. There's you don't have to deal with a, a consultant and try to win the bid. Mm -hmm. There's a trust there, uh, and you're top of mind. I've got a 
I've got a, a buddy in sales who likes to say, uh, I know that if I'm talking to my customer, somebody else isn't talking to my customer. It's a very good point. Um, it's a very good point. Let's talk about, let's talk about the question we got from our audience already. Um, you know, Matt and I covered in some of the news sections the, the importance of service contracts. To me, that's a pretty obvious model to get recurring revenues. Let's set up some sort of service agreement. You'll pay me X dollars a month. I'll make sure everything is running smoothly and perfectly. What other kinds of model for recurring revenue are there? So there are a bunch of different models. I do want to at least touch briefly on service contracts, though, because uh, they tend to have Feel a lot free, of different yeah. permutations. Uh, I mean, it could be as simple as break fix. I mean, and that's obviously not going to produce a whole lot of RMR. Uh, it could be as complex and ambitious as something like 24-7 monitoring and remote support with guarantees of negligible or zero downtime. So imagine you you have a venue that's holding like a Super Bowl event or something like that. You could have a, a contract or a service agreement where there's an assurance that someone is going to get off their couch, step away from the TV on that Sunday evening, and they're going to remote in right then and there and fix the problem so that your Super Bowl event goes off without a hitch. That's obviously a whole lot more complex, and you're going to pay more for it than something as simple as break fix. Then there's the other idea of AV as a subscription, so something akin to Netflix, something akin to Apple Music, HBO Max, uh, Microsoft Office these days. The thrust of that is you talk about a conference room or a classroom, for example. It's not getting the AV equipment with the purpose of owning it. It's getting the AV equipment with the purpose of using it and only using it, just like you don't own Microsoft Office anymore. You just use it. So you would pay monthly or quarterly or yearly to use the gear. And it's kind of taking the whole concept of ownership out of the equation. And there are companies like Tamco, and I'm not affiliated with them. I'm just mentioning them because I happen to have heard a presentation recently where they kind of finance that initial gear outlay. And that's one path of doing things. You know, they get their money, obviously, by financing the outlay, and then they make money on, uh, you know, the interest and all of that. But they work with integrators, and then an integrator gets a cut of that monthly money for integrating the system and then servicing and maintaining the system. So it could be like a 60-month contract, and Tamco gets it, its money, and the integrator gets its money in that regular monthly cadence for integrating and for uh you know, uh, monitoring and maintaining the system. So that's another way of doing it. It's AV as a subscription. Yeah. Uh, so certainly I've, I've heard of this AV as a service, AV as a subscription concept before uh, that, that seems to me like what I say, like sort of as, as far as we can go. Um, you know, at that point we've sort of virtualized the whole thing. Um, I, I know that I think Volvo does this with some cars. Now you, you it's not even a lease. It's a, it's a subscription. You pay 600 bucks a month, you get a Volvo XC40 or something for two years, and, and then you just give it back at the end. Um, is that as far as we can go? Is there any other crazy model out there? I, I don't think so. I'm just exploring the space a little. I think given the relative um, hesitance of some people to approach anything other than a capital expenditure, I, I think that's probably as far as we can go right now, because, you know, when I was listening to that presentation, there was a lot of interest, there was a lot of engagement, but there was also a lot of skepticism. So I think just that model itself, you know, the, the Microsoft Office model is revolutionary enough and uh, surprising enough to a lot of people that that's probably as far as we can go in the immediate term. But obviously, there's a lot of work to do to embrace even something like that. We're not anywhere close to it at this point. I was I was setting up to ask, do you think we can get to a world of, of, of entirely subscription based AV? I think you just told me not right now. So let me ask this. What needs to happen or, or what could happen or tell me it's impossible to get to a world sometime down the road where where practically all let's say let's say commercial AV, because I'm going to imagine that residential AV is going to be very different. Uh, but let's say that all commercial AV is is by a service. Uh, do you think do you think we can approach that world? And if so, what would need to happen? I think we we may be able to approach that world, um, but I, I really don't think we're ever going to be entirely subscription based or AV as a service based. And I don't say any of this pejoratively, but I mean, there's still people who subscribe sure. to print newspapers and they're not going to read their news online. There are still people who watch DVDs and they're not going to necessarily stream their content. It's just to say that some people like to stick to established ways. And there are integrators right now, many mm -hmm. of them, who are making millions and millions of dollars in revenue doing capital projects 
And it's going to be hard to convince them to tear up a model that for years and decades has worked for them and shift entirely to something new. Um, but I do think it's doable mm -hmm. to move from, you know, four or five percent services or four or five percent subscription in terms of revenue to something approaching 25 percent. I think that's that's doable. And you know, one of the reasons, one of the impetuses, I think, for doing that is just the margin aspect. Um, you know, commercial integrator does studies with integrators every year, our state of the industry study. And, you know, you hear about integrators making maybe 12% margin on capital projects, on the hardware at least, on 15% margins mm -hmm. for hardware, 16%. When I talk to my friend Tom LeBlanc and Chuck Wilson at, at NSCA, they say they think overhead for a lot of integrators is in the mid to high 20%. So if your hardware margins are below your overhead, that is problematic. And yes, you can make it up in labor, you can make it up in other things. But the idea is, if you're a capital expenditure based integrator, and your margins on hardware are so small relative to what your overhead is, that should, I think, give you a reason to say there has to be a better way of doing this. Because otherwise, you're just clawing for every every dime and every every nickel. Yeah, that's amazing. And I'm thinking, I'm thinking what that's really going to do is, is clamp down on your ability to have inventory. And here we are in a, in a supply chain constrained world where inventory can be a massive advantage. That's a very difficult trade off to make. Do I want inventory that's costing me this much money or, or do I not? But then can I get it? Oh, well, that, that's a whole other discussion. Um, <clears throat> you mentioned figures like, like four or five percent. Is that is that approximately how much of, let's say, integrator revenue is recurring these days? Uh, paint a picture of, of, of what percentage is recurring right now. To some extent, and you know, this is no surprise, it depends on the integrator to whom you speak. There are some who of have course, much I, better yeah. built out RMR kind of operations than others do. But it seems like most of those to whom I speak are in the single digits. But that isn't to indicate that they aren't growing rapidly. I mean, commercial integrators, integrator of the year, logic integration. I was talking to Sean Hansen earlier this year, and he said that they uh, relatively low in terms of uh, services, but they doubled this most recent year and they're intending to double every year for the foreseeable future. So, you know, whether it's from, you know, three to six to 12, whatever the case is, um, there's a trajectory of moving in that direction. And some forward thinking integrators are really moving in that direction quite rapidly. And I was just speaking to Frank McCann of McCann Systems a few days ago, uh, and he was talking about you know, the extent to which they've invested in services. And although they don't do a whole lot of the AV as a subscription uh, kind of model where it's a lease or something like that, they said 99% of their projects have some kind of service associated with them. Now, it could be, again, wow. as simple as break fix. Uh, so it's not necessarily yeah. that 24 seven thing, but 99% of McCann Systems clients have some kind of a continuing relationship with them. So it really, I guess it depends if you're trying to quantify it, how you're defining services. Is it a subscription? I think it's going to be a pretty small percentage right now. Is it services of some sort, including break fix? It could be much larger. And the really built out and most successful firms have gotten quite high in terms of uh, building that into their day-to-day -day operations. Yeah. Okay. That makes sense. Um, how widely adopted is AV as a service these days? Is that is that something that is truly rolled out in places? And and then and then the follow up is, is there a pattern? Right? Is it is it uh, some particular vertical, for example, that that has latched onto AV as a service, or or is it still so new that we don't know where it's going? Um, I wouldn't say that it's necessarily so new that we don't know where it's going, but I, I think that you're seeing different permutations of it in different areas. I mean, certainly uh, when you're thinking about like corporate entities and schools, education venues, things of that nature, which of course are, are kind of the backbone in a lot of respects of the commercial integration market. I mean, I don't have data in front of me, but when you think about integrators that specialize in the commercial space, you would imagine a lot of what they do is enterprise, a lot of what they do is corporate, a lot of what they do is education education. And a lot of those clients have very little tolerance for downtime, very little tolerance for saying, oh, you know, the, we have to close down the classroom, we have to close down that venue, or the, the conference room isn't available today, despite the fact that we have an important client coming in and we have an essential meeting to hold. Um, I think when there is a very low tolerance for failure, 
and a very high sense of mission critical um, necessity of, of excellence, that's somewhere where AV as a service is going to be more valuable. And again, it may not permu it may not be the permutation of AV as a subscription, but if there is zero tolerance for failure and zero tolerance for downtime, then it's going to be a whole lot more persuasive if I, as an integration company, come in and say, I'm going to remote in within 30 minutes of a call. I'm not going to have to roll a truck. I'm not going to say I'll fix it on Thursday. I can have someone remote in. This is their cell phone number and they will be available to you or someone, one of their colleagues will be available to you immediately to make sure that that class goes off without a hitch, that meeting goes off without a hitch, and you don't have to send the students home or send that executive home without having had the conversation. Yeah, that makes sense. You know, and maybe that speaks to to just how broadly this this might be successful. Um, I'm, I'm thinking back. We had a guest on a few episodes ago. I can't remember who or what, but basically they said something like, uh, you know, everyone thinks their own business is mission critical. Uh, so maybe mm -hmm. taking advantage of that with with AV as a service and, and the reliability it brings uh, works out. Dan, sit tight. We're gonna we're gonna cut to uh, wrap up the show, but I want you to stick around for the after show. We've already got some questions coming in from the audience here. Keep those coming, everybody. Uh, and we'll see you in just a couple of minutes, Dan. Meanwhile, you guys head over for a fact check. Great interview there, Justin, fantastic. Thank you for your questions so far. Don't forget to check out the resource panel below where you can see our news articles, plus more to help you figure out how your company can maximize on recurring revenue streams. There are two courses in there about vertical markets where recurring support models could make an awful lot of sense. So have a look through them to understand how SDVOE fits in, and then go fit that to your recurring revenue model on top of that. Plus, there's a course that explains how SDVOE is different than the AV systems that came before. Give yourself a new way to think about signal distribution and system management. SDVOE is recurring revenue friendly. Anyway, uh, we're going to head back to Justin now to find out what's happening next week, and I'll see you very shortly in the after show. Thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. I want you to catch us all on social media. Don't forget to use the hashtag SDVOE live. Also, I want to thank our sponsor for this episode, Black Box. Uh, so big thanks to Black Box. And then I want to tell you that our next show is coming up on May 3rd. We have a very special treat for you on that episode. Uh, I'm not ready to tell you what it is yet, but make sure you tune in on May 3rd at the usual time, 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern, uh, and see what that's all about. Because we do this every two weeks. But if you miss an episode, don't forget to check us out on our YouTube channel, that's youtube.com slash SDVOE Alliance. Head over there and like and subscribe. But now I want you to stick around for the after show. We've got some questions for you coming in. Bring more in live at SDVOE.org. I also have a few more questions for Dan. I wanted to find out what can go wrong with, with monthly revenue, uh, recurring monthly revenue. Uh, what are the pitfalls to look out for? What are the mistakes that people have already made and how can we learn to avoid those? So make sure you watch for that. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. I hope you're looking forward to it. Sit tight. The credits will be rolling momentarily and all you have to do is sit and don't push any buttons at all. We'll see you soon in the after show.